Dr. Shetty has treated a diverse population of children, adolescents, and adults in a variety of clinical settings, including community clinics, college counseling centers, psychiatric hospitals, private practice, and private treatment programs. She has extensive experience in the area of child and adult psychological evaluation and assessment and recently completed a postdoctoral residency in psych psychological evaluation. Her graduate training led Dr. Shetty to discover an interest in helping individuals with autism and developmental disorders. She has provided individual therapy, group therapy, and social skills training to individuals on the autism spectrum and is excited to continue helping those with autism and related disorders by providing psychological evaluations at the Johnson Center. Before we begin the presentation, please note that questions can be typed into your control panel throughout the presentation, and time permitting, they will be addressed at the end. Also, for those of you that have requested copies of the presentation, uh, we cannot send out the presenter's slides However, we do post recordings of all of our free webinars on the Johnson Center YouTube channel. Please search for us on YouTube and subscribe to get full access to all of our free recorded webinars. Now please welcome Dr. Claire Shetty. Hello everyone, thank you for joining me today. Um, I'm gonna be presenting an introduction to a four-part series that I'm excited to be hosting here at the Johnson Center. Um, today is an overview on transitions for adolescents and young adults with autism spectrum disorders. See my slide. There we go. Um, so a quick overview of what I'm going to be covering today. Like I said, today is part one of a four-part series. And today I'm going to be talking about general information regarding transitions and transition planning for adolescents and young adults with autism spectrum disorders. So I'm going to be covering topics such as um, available services for transitions, who can help with transitions, some related laws, as well as how you can help plan for transitions, whether you're a parent of a young adult with autism um, or a professional who works with adolescents or young adults with autism. But make sure to stay tuned for the next three parts of this four-part series because in those sections I'm going to be talking more specifically about strategies um, and supports for planning um, and supporting transitions in these following areas. Um, the second part of the series will be on independent living the third part will be on social relationships, and the fourth part will be on higher education um, and jobs and vocational support. So what I'd encourage you to do, um, as Nisi mentioned, um, time permitting, there will be hopefully some time for questions at the end of this um, seminar. However, what I would like you to do is if, you, if there are any suggestions or things that you would like to learn more about, in these three areas, um, please enter those into the question boxes and I'll do my best to cover some of your suggestions or areas that you're hoping to be covered um, in these three areas. Again, independent living, social relationships, and higher education and jobs. The importance of this topic of planning for transitions and transitions for young adults, um, it's important for a lot of reasons. As we all know, the rates of autism spectrum disorders continue to be on the rise. And a lot of times the focus of services and funding is on early identification and early intervention. Um, which is very critical and important. However, all of these children that we're identifying with autism spectrum disorders are becoming adolescents and young adults and we're going to be having more and more adolescents and young adults on the spectrum as we continue to see the rates of autism increase if we do con continue to see that increase. <clears throat> the needs of young adults with autism um, often exceed the current resources that we now have available. So there's a high need for further resources and support for adolescents and young adults with autism. 
and there seems to be kind of a drop off of services and support. We're getting more and more. However, like I said, a lot of it does tend to focus on um, early intervention and we need more research, more resources and education on how to best meet our adolescent and young adults with autism's changing needs. Because really the transition to adulthood is a huge change and it's very complex and it's different for every individual who is on the spectrum um, you know, and they're going to have their own unique needs and need their own individualized support and transition planning. A quick review on just some, some of the recent research on education and employment for young adults with autism spectrum disorders. Uh, most previous studies have shown that there are low rates of post-secondary education and employment for adults on the autism spectrum disorder. A recent study that was done by Shattuck et al. in 2012, um, which was published in the Journal of Pediatrics, they used a large national sample and compared young adults with autism spectrum disorders to those with other developmental differences, which included speech delays, um, intellectual disability, um, and other similar developmental differences. And what this study found was that the first two years after high school, um, adolescents are at a higher risk for no education or employment. So these early two years after high school are really a critical period um, for risk of, of no employment or no post-secondary education. And this kind of pointed to the importance of transition planning um, before and during this period. Overall, um, young adults with autism in the study were at higher risk for difficulties compared to the other groups um, with other developmental differences. And the study also found that the financial support of the individual and their level of functional skills was associated with outcome. So the more financial support the individual had and the higher level of their functional skills, these were associated with better outcomes. Another relevant document, which is titled The Current State of Services for Adults with Autism, um, this was published in 2009 by the Organization for Autism Research and the State of California Department of Developmental Services. The document was prepared by Peter Gerhardt. Um, and this was just a review on available services for young adults with autism. And they note in this review that the vast majority of adults with autism spectrum disorders are unemployed or underemployed. The majority continue to live with parents, siblings, or older relatives. And the greatest impediments are system inadequacies as well as public perception of adults on the spectrum being unemployable. Um, so there are some roadblocks for young adults as you can see and as these reviews and research shows that we really do need more support and more resources um, as well as to educate um, service providers and just educate employers and provide more education on the abilities of individuals with autism spectrum disorders and kind of debunk some of those misperceptions. So who should be helping with transitions for adolescents and young adults with autism spectrum disorders? Well some of these are the government and the state, our education system, agency representatives, communities, employers, parents and family, therapists um, such as board certified behavior analysts, as well as health care providers. Um, and it's important to think about what the transition experience is like for young adults with autism spectrum disorders. 
um, this this big transition does bring some positives such as excitement for the future and it can help further develop important areas such as independence and independent skills, the individual's confidence and self-worth, um, interest in skills, goal-setting skills, accountability, self-determination, as well as self-advocacy. However, this big transition can also bring a lot of challenges. Change can be very difficult for individuals with autism spectrum disorder, um, and these major life transitions can trigger some anxiety and worries and fears. It can create some new pressures, and it can also trigger and intensify symptoms. So it's really important as we're supporting individuals in these transitions to regularly check in with them and make sure that we're supporting them as they transition. Parents play a very important role in the transition process. A lot of times parents and family continue to be the primary source of support for their adult child with an autism spectrum disorder. Parents are typically their child's primary advocate. Um, parents, you know your child best and you can provide personal information regarding your child's skills and strengths and challenges and what really makes them unique, as well as what unique needs they have. Um, parents play a big role in monitoring transition planning and making sure that the transition plan is meaningful and practical. Parents are also a big support of their young adults' independence, their self-advocacy and decision-making, and they also play a big role and are often responsible for planning financial and support needs. So now I'm going to review some of the relevant laws, policies, and services um, related to transitions. And I will start by saying that I'm not an expert on all of the um, laws and policies, so I do encourage you um, to get more detailed information if needed, and I've provided some resources to do that. Um, but to start off, one of one big law that's related to transitions has to do with the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act of 2004. Uh, most of you are probably familiar with the IDEA um, and how this impacts students' IEPs and IEP planning. So a lot of this um, has been planned to support transitions for young adults with autism. Um, and it outlines the need to provide effective transition services to help promote successful post-school employment and or education. So what the IDEA um, notes is that transition services and planning are available to students who receive special education. And it's not just in available, um, transition services must be provided um, to individuals who receive special education. There are specific requirements for transition support that are supposed to start no, no later than age 16. In some states, I believe, um, it must start as early as age 14. So the actual support is supposed to start no later than age 16, and it continues until the age of 21. The transition services is part of the IDEA of 2004. It helps determine um, transition goals and what transition services are needed, such as with education, skill development, um, and what's necessary to help the individual meet their transition goals. So goals might be related to post-secondary education, vocational training, supported employment, adult services, independent living, and community participation. Those are just a few examples. Services must be outcome-oriented based on both needs and strengths of the young adult or adolescent, 
and focus not just on post-secondary education or education, but also on employment and living skills. Two other laws that I'd like to cover are the Americans with Disabilities Act and the Vocational Rehabilitation Act, Section 504. And these two laws, um, they basically can help take over, provide some su support after the transition services through the IDEA of 2004 are done. Um, so these can kind of pick off where, uh, pick up where that one leaves off. The Americans with Disabilities Act is a civil rights act, and basically it protects against discrimination against individuals with disabilities in areas such as employment, housing, transportation, and things like that. Employers must provide accommodations to employees to those who can perform their job duties with reasonable accommodations. The ADA, or Americans with Disabilities Act, um, support isn't contingent upon programs that receive federal funding. So this applies to any type of program or employer. Um, they don't have to receive federal funding for the ADA to apply. The Vocational Rehabilitation Act, Section 504, is another law or policy to be familiar with. <clears throat> it's also a civil rights act, and similarly to the ADA, it protects against discrimination against individuals with disability who can perform their job duties with reasonable accommodations. Um, under this, this act, it can provide rehabilitation services, that usually include things like employment and residential supports. And it also helps support individuals dis with disabilities in post-secondary education or college, um, such as providing learning accommodations in college and, and providing services through state colleges. Now it's important to note that this law, Section 504, only applies to organizations or employees who receive federal funding. So when I'm talking about um, college accommodations, it would need to be um, a state school, for example, that receives federal funding. So these are three different laws, again, that are important to be familiar with. Um, it should also be noted that the ADA and Section 504 they promote equal access to services for individuals with disabilities, however, they don't necessarily guarantee the appropriateness of services. So that's important to keep in mind when you are obtaining services through these different acts and laws. So here are some resources of where you can find further information on these. Um, if you're not familiar with Rights Law, Rights Law is a wonderful resource for learning more about educational law. You can find it at www.rightslaw.org. And then here are some other general links um, where you can learn more about the different laws that I've just gone over. Um, there's also a good guide that I came across on the Autism Speaks website that was compiled by Goodwin Pro and Proctor. And it goes over in detail um, specifics about the IDEA of 2004, as well as the ADA in Section 504. Um, and the link to that resource can be found right here on the bottom. Now here's a quick list of additional types of support services that are available for adolescents and young adults with autism spectrum disorders as they transition. There are day programs. Counseling can also provide support. Support groups um, such as groups for young adults with autism where they can meet other young adults with autism. Um, case management can also be helpful. 
different types of relevant therapies such as applied behavior analysis, occupational therapy, or speech therapy. There's also post-secondary private residential support programs out there that are often um, very comprehensive and provide supports with um, students going to college, independent living, um, many times they're actual residential programs so students might live on site and have um, specific supports for things like cooking and, and social outings and things like that. In many communities there's recreation programs, residential programs, as well as respite services. All of these are just some examples of a different of other types of support services that can help with the transition process. A lot of times um, colleges offer unique support for individuals on the spectrum. Um, some areas of services um, that often do provide support are the Office of Disability Services. The Counseling Center of the college can also be a great um, support service. Most colleges have a career resource center um, that can provide vocational support, support in finding jobs, interviews, and things like that. Some colleges have support groups um, specifically for individuals with disabilities or with autism spectrum disorders. And some colleges are adapting programs and support specifically for students with autism spectrum disorders. Um, one helpful resource that I came across is called the College Autism Spectrum. The link can be found at www.collegeautismspectrum.com. And basically, um, one of the resources I came across on this website is a link to colleges that do provide specific supports for college students on the spectrum. So that's another good resource to look into. So when you're starting this process um, or helping your child or if you're a professional wanting to learn more about services, here's some tips on how to learn more about services for young adults with autism. Um, it's important to study all of the related laws and policies. Know what your rights are as a parent as well as what your young adult child's rights are. It's very important to gain information on related services in your state because services do vary from state to state. It's important to gain information on how to qualify for services. Um, it can also be very helpful to join advocacy groups to network and gain further information. An example of an advocacy group that's out there is Advancing Futures for Adults with Autism, and the link can be found right there. As well as to do your own research on groups, organizations, and books that provide resource guides for adult transitions, and there are some great resources out there and I'll share some of those at the end of my presentation today. There are some challenges that many of the agencies and support services um, have or there can be a lot of challenges in terms of accessing services. One of the challenges is a lot of times there can be a lack of coordination between services for example, between an adolescent's high school and community-based services, for example. Funding is a huge issue. Um, a lot of agencies and support services are underfunded, and this definitely impacts the state of the services that they can provide. Many services are limited by the length of what they can brought provide and how they can continue those services. A lot of times there's wait lists. Um, the service might not actually be that appropriate for the young adult. Transportation can be a big issue. A lot of the agencies involved in transition processes and supports for adults 
have a lot of staff turnover, which can definitely impact the quality of service provided. And there can be a lack of understanding regarding the potential and the unique needs of adults with autism spectrum disorders. And this can also impact the quality of services that they get. So now I'd like to talk about transition planning um, and how you can help your young adult with autism or adolescent transition as well as just some tips for the transition planning process. Transition planning should take effect early, um, so during high school or either earlier, and continue throughout their transition. So it should really be an ongoing process. So early on in the planning process, it's important to start learning about available resources to explore the best fit for your child and your family, to support your child's own self-advocacy and what their hopes are for the future, to start early planning and outlining what the transition will entail, and to kind of just start creating a vision with your young adult on what their hopes are and what your hopes are. The transition plan and process will be different for every individual based on what their strengths and needs and preferences and challenges are. A good place to start and an important place to start in the planning process is with assessment to determine what the goals and needs are. So when you're assessing all of this, um, the assessment process, it's important for it to be both person focused, so focused on the adolescent or young adult with autism, as well as to include their primary support network, um, parents, family, and those that are very involved in their care and their transition. So some areas that are important to assess as part of the planning are the individual's interests, their skills, their experiences, what support they already have available and what support they need. And you also want to assess what their skills and areas of challenges are in the area of communication, social, behavioral, executive functioning, so things like their planning skills, organization, those are both executive functioning skills really come into play with things like independent living and, and navigating college life and things like that, as well as any sensory related um, sensitivities. So anything that could impact their transition related to these factors is important to consider, as well as what skills they have within these areas that will help them with the transition. Like I mentioned a moment ago, it's important to really involve and focus on the adolescent or young adult and what their hopes are and, and person-centered planning is a specific approach that can help with transition planning and planning for the future. And basically what it does is it supports the unique individual in creating a vision for their future along with supportive members such as their parents, teachers, community advocates. Person-centered planning, it really helps support self-advocacy skills of the individual. It focuses on discussing their hopes and long-term goals as well as short-term goals that can help them reach those. It also focuses on their interests, their capabilities and challenges and how to build upon previous experiences that they're coming in with. Some examples of person-centered planning approaches are PATH and MAPS. Um, PATH stands for Planning Alternative Tomorrows with Hope, and MAPS stands for Making Action Plans. So person-centered planning, again, there's many specific approaches and strategies, um, such as these two but it really helps focus on assessing what the unique needs and goals and hopes are of the individual. 
So here's an example that I pulled um, from a resource. And this is just an example of a portion of um, Joey's person-centered plan. Um, so as part of Joey's person center plan, they came up with what people need to know and do to support him or to support me. And these are just some examples that he came up with, such as be a good listener, um, mentioning some tendencies that he has and some areas of difficulties that, that he has that people should be aware of that might impact his transition. And here's a list of just what he indicates as some of his coping skills and activities. Um, these are things that can help him when he might be experiencing stress or a difficult time during a transition. So things like playing video games, listening to music, um, weightlifting, drinking coffee. So as you can see, these are um, specific things that the individual came up with on their own. And again, this is just an example of a portion of an individual's person-centered plan. Um, and this I, I got from the resource Person-Centered Planning Pathways to Your Future. Um, and I also have that listed at the end if you'd like to use that as a resource as well. So some things that should be included in the Young Adults Transition Plan are goals and preferences for education, employment, independent living, community involvement, leisure and recreation, health and wellness, as well as overall quality of life. When creating goals for the transition plan, it's important to include um, steps and a specific timeline to meet those goals. So you want to include both short and long-term goals, and you want to make sure that the goals that you're indicating in the transition plan are measurable. Here's an example of a measurable transition goal. Um, this is obtained from the Organiza Organization for Autism Research and the Southwest Autism Research and Resource Center um, through a great guide that they published titled Life Journey Through Autism, a Guide for Transitions to Adulthood. So again, here's a great example of a measurable transition goal. Um, the overarching goal is that the student will have appropriate work environment post high school. That's a pretty general, more long-term goal. Some of the measurable goals or short-term goals that they're identifying to meet that more long-term goal are that together with the school guidance counselor, transition coordinator, or vo vocational rehabilitation counselor, the student will explore options for employment post high school. They'll complete a vocational assessment and participate in a minimum of one unpaid internship, volunteer experience, or after-school job in an area of their interest over the next six months. So they're indicating that all of this will take place within this timeline of the next six months. The participation is defined as a minimum of five hours per week for no less than 12 weeks. So again, they identify how long or a measurable goal here, a minimum of five hours per week for no less than 12 weeks. So again, it's important to make sure that you're identifying measurable goals to meet some of those long-term transition goals. It's also important to indicate what resources and methods the young adult needs to help them meet these goals. So for example, what tailored support and instruction is needed in the areas of academics, vocational, independent living, or social? What accommodations might they need to meet the goals? What services are needed to meet the goals? Are there specific agencies or laws that will help? As well as what funding is needed. 
And you also want to include regular assessment to help determine the young adult's progress towards these goals and to help aid in further planning. And when, when teaching or instruction of different transition skills is completed, um, it's important for the teaching of transition skills to be proactive. Um, so a lot of these transition skills should occur before the actual transition and then also be applied during the transition. So things like um, independent living skills and vocational skills, those should start early on before the individual actually transitions. It's also very important to consider how you can generalize these skills that you're teaching as part of the transition plan um, and how they can be generalized to relevant environments. So for example, if you're teaching things like life skills, um, let's say for example um, cooking skills in a high school classroom environment, you want to make sure that you're also planning for generalization and checking to see if those skills are generalizing or if they're being applied to more real-life environments such as the individual's home. Um, or if you're, for example, practicing interview skills um, in more of a classroom setting, it's important to set up either a, a mock interview situation um, or role plays or things like that to help see if those skills that you're teaching, again, and are generalizing to more real-life environments. So now I'd like to talk about some different areas that are important to consider um, during the transition planning um, and to consider what supports are necessary in these areas. Again, this is going to be a brief overview, but I'm going to be talking about many of these areas and more specifics and more specifics about how to support young adults in these areas in the upcoming webinars. So again, make sure to stay tuned for part two, three, and four um, when I'll be covering more details about these. So the first area to consider um, within transition planning is independent living. So you want to think about things like what type of home might, might be most appropriate. Is it at the parent's house? Is it a dorm, a group home, um, on the young, totally independent, living on their own, a residential program? It's also important to consider the location of the home, such as proximity to parents and family, to the young adult's college or school, their job, available transportation. Within the area of independent living, it's also very important to consider what are the individual's functional life skills and adaptive behavior skills. For example, things like hygiene, personal safety, cooking and cleaning, managing finances. Um, what skills are they coming in with and what supports do they need in this area? As well as more generally, what level of support do they need for independent living? Um, is an inpatient residential program more appropriate um, versus more just supported living versus college support or a group home. So again, it's important to consider the overall level of support that's needed for independent living. Within the social area, some things that are important to consider or to plan for are how to help the young adult build a good social support network, how to support them in making social connections and friendships during transitions, um, dating and relationships, intimate relationships and sexuality is important to cover, um, work relationships, school relationships, living relationships such as having a roommate for the first time, living in a dorm for the first time, as well as teaching um, and assessing self-advocacy skills um, and discussing whether or not um, the young adult will want to disclose having autism 
to anyone um, during their transitions and who might these people be and what might they want to disclose. So transitions do bring a lot of new um, social related factors into the equation and these are all important to consider. Higher education is another important area. Um, so you want to think about things like the t what type of school or program would be most appropriate. For example, a community college versus a four-year college. Um, a private school versus a state school, liberal arts colleges, vocational and technical schools. There's a lot of different options out there and it's important to think about what might be the best fit for the young adult. Again, you want to consider the location of the school or program, the size, would a smaller school be better, um, will they be okay in a bigger school with the right supports. You also want to look into what supports are available. So again, you want to um, be proactive and think about any 504 accommodations um, through a state college that might be available, such as extended time on tests, being able to take a test in a low distraction environment, um, note taking services, as well as checking out the school's Office of Disability Services any support groups they offer, as well as looking into um, any organizations or clubs or support networks that might be a good fit for the young adult. Um, so if there's a really great club or organization in one of their interest areas, that might be a good selling point because that might be a source of social support for the individual and really help them connect and get acclimated with other students who have similar interests. Jobs and vocational factors are also very important to um, consider in transition planning. So during the planning process, um, the student should start working on career exploration, um, assessment, and learning different skills. Um, related to areas that they might be interested in. So some things that can help are interest and skills assessments, job shadowing, um, early work experience such as volunteering or part-time work, um, specific training on particular skills, practicing interviews, and learning just about different vocational training opportunities in the community. It can also be helpful to start exploring potential jobs just to see what's out there and to get a feel for what's out there. It's important to focus on the best fit for the young adult, um, including what their skills are, their interests, the type of job, the location, the hours, the level of support it provides. Um, will transportation be easy, for example? So considering all of these factors. Um, it's also good to prepare for um, any disclosures or educating employers on what the young adults, um, how they might best function in the work environment and how to advocate for that to their employers. And lastly, it's important to consider what on-the-job support they might need. So will this be um, from the employers and coworkers? Um, a job coach, a therapist that might come and assist them with the job. Again, all of these are important to consider. Health and wellness is another important area within transitions. So you want to think about how to plan and support nutrition, exercise, medication management, uh, medical appointments, sleep schedule. Sleep can really be thrown off during the transition process, especially if the individual is transitioning to a, a totally new environment. Um, so sleep is very important. Stress management, sexual health, psychological health, as well as leisure and recreation are all important to consider when supporting the young adult in the transition process. 
So before we wrap up and I review some of your questions, I'd like to go over some of the resources um, that can be helpful in the transition process. There's some great transition guides out there um, that were great references for this presentation as well. Um, these three listed here, the first is the Transition to adult, Adulthood, Guidelines for Individuals with Autism Spectrum Disorders. This is by the Ohio Autism Task Force, the Ohio Center for Autism, um, and the Incidence Transition to Community Task Force. Another great transition guide is Life Journey Through Autism um, by Dania International and the Organization for Autism Research and the Southwest Autism Research and Resource Center. And then a, another great review and guide is the current state of services for adults with autism. This one is by the New York Center for Autism and the document was prepared by Peter Gerhardt and the Organization for Autism Research. These are all great transition guides and they can be found online. Autism Speaks has some great adult service pages. Um, one link can be found here. This one is specifically on adult services. They also have a transition toolkit that can be found right here. Um, there's also some great books out there. The Autism Transition Guide, Planning the Journey from School to Adult Life, as well as Autism and the Transition to Adulthood. And then here's some more, um, Essentials of Transition Planning, Guiding Your Teenager with Special Needs Through the Transition from School to Adult Life. Um, Peter Gerhardt has a lot of great publications and presentations. He's an expert on um, young adult issues um, and young adults with autism spectrum disorders. He's with the McCartan School. I would encourage you to um, watch and access some of his presentations. Um, they're really great, as well as the Autism Research Institute also has an adult services page that can be found right here. Okay, and here are some of my references. And now it looks like we have a few minutes for questions, so I'm just going to take a moment to review those. Um, again, at this time, I would like to encourage you to also enter in any suggestions or areas that you would like to learn more about related to independent living, social transitions, as well as um, higher education and jobs. Um, I would love to review what you would like to hear and I'll try to do my best to integrate that um, into my upcoming presentations on those topics. So I'm just going to be taking a moment to review those and I'll be right back. Okay, I, I got a few questions that are related to um, 
parents reporting that the school, that they did have a transition plan, but it wasn't necessarily appropriate or adequate and how to kind of catch up or get better services if the school isn't providing that within the transition plan. Um, if you feel that the school district isn't providing adequate um, services to meet your child's needs, um, one resource to get further information or to get more support in kind of fighting for getting further services would be to consult with an educational advocate. Um, if your child still is enrolled in school, um, an educational advocate could help support um, you know, how to, how to navigate asking for further services and kind of supporting getting those. Um, one resource for that is, um, I believe it's called the, I know for Texas it's TOPA, the Texas um, Organization of Parents, Advocates, and Attorneys. However, there is um, a more national resource for that, um, which is COPA, and I'm blanking on what COPA stands for, but it is an organization of parents, advocates, and attorneys. Um, and if you do do a Google search for COPA, um, C-O-P-P-A, I believe, um, that should pull up a list of resources for finding an educational advocate. Um, it can be frustrating because, again, um, depending on the school district, you know, services provided through the IEP and through the IDEA a lot of times aren't adequate or sufficient. So it is important to know what your rights are as the parent. Um, and a lot of times finding an educational advocate can help that. Another great resource for understanding what your rights and laws are um, is the website rightslaw.org. Um, rights okay, I'm just going to, it takes me a moment to read all, through all of these questions, so just bear with me for a moment. Okay, here's a question. Um, it states, how do you decide whether to reveal an autism diagnosis at school, college, or work? Um, that's a great question. In terms of school or college, um, if you do want to access 504 accommodations, which pro would provide learning and educational accommodations um, through a state-funded college, um, in that case, you would have to disclose uh, autism to the school because the Office of Disability Services would have to review and have documentation of a diagnosis um, in order to provide 504 accommodations. And when I say 504 accommodations, um, those are things like um, learning accommodations in the classroom, such as um, the young adult having extra time to take tests or to be able to take their test in a low distraction environment. Um, those are some just examples of learning accommodations that can be provided in the college. Um, but again, the autism diagnosis would need to be disclosed to the Office of Disability Services in order for um, them to receive some of those accommodations. Now, in terms of deciding whether to reveal the autism diagnosis um, at the individual's workplace, for example, um, that can be a personal and family-based decision, um, you know, and it's going to vary according to the individual of what benefits disclosing the diagnosis would provide, as well as what um, negatives disclosing the diagnosis might create. So you really have to work with the young adult and as a family to decide if disclosing the diagnosis is most appropriate. Now there's ways around um, making a clear disclosure of autism 
to the employer. So you could just state um, these are some things you know that make work particularly hard for me and these are things that that help me perform my best in a job um, and make that list very specific and provide that to the employer so that they're aware of what some of the special needs are of the individual as well as specific strategies um, such as with the work environment or with particular supports of how they can perform best. Let's see, and it looks like we are about out of time for questions, um, but I would like to um, just remind you that we cannot send out copies of the presentation slides, um, but we do post all of our webinars on the Johnson Center YouTube channel. So if you're hoping to look back at the presentation, we will be uploading that to our YouTube channel. Um, however, we cannot release slides individually. Um, but thank you all for joining me and I did, I was able to see some great suggestions and points that you're hoping for me to cover so I'll be reviewing those and um, please stay tuned for the next three parts of this four-part series on independent living, um, vocational and job skills as well as social transitions. And I look forward to um, meeting with you again for those. Again, thank you for your time.